Well, it's really great to be here tonight. Got a lot of things to talk about tonight. And um, one of the things I might like to start talking about is exactly what is normal. When has mild autistic traits, sort of geeks and nerds, become mild autism? You know, half of Silicon Valley probably has a little bit of autism. <laughs> it's a very, very big spectrum. And at one end of the spectrum, you've got maybe uh, Steve Jobs, Silicon Valley computer guys, the guy who fixes your copier machine. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got people much more handicapped and nonverbal, definitely going to have to live in a supervised living situation. Now, you take somebody like Albert Einstein, no speech until age three. What would happen to little Albert Jr. in today's school system? This sort of makes me shudder. You know, how many drugs would they get him on? Way too many drugs given out to little kids. You know, a little bit of some of these traits can give an advantage. Because research has shown that in the family histories of people that are bipolar, you've got more creative types of people. In the family histories of people with autism, you've got more technical kind of careers. You know, a little bit of the trait gives some advantage. Too much of the trait, a great big disadvantage. You know, at some point, it's normal variation. Now, one of the problems in dealing with autism is this word, autism. You know, there's so many different people covered by this word, from people that can be very accomplished to people that will have to um, live in a supervised living situation. Diagnosis has changed over the years. Autism diagnosis is not precise. It's not like a diagnosis for tuberculosis. You know, you've either got tuberculosis or you don't have it. It's very definite. And the American Psychiatric Association has a book called the DSM. And when the first version came out, when I was a little kid, they thought autism was caused by, you know, psychoanalytic, you know, kind of problems. You know, then there was the horrible phase where parents got blamed for it. And then the second edition, they didn't even mention autism at all. They just left it out. Then in the third edition, you had to have speech delay and onset before three years of age. Then in the early 90s, they added Asperger's, where you could have the social communication deficits and no speech delay. So now you've broadened the mild end of the spectrum. So now when the DSM-5 comes out at the American Psychiatric Association Convention in just a few weeks, uh, they're gonna take the Asperger's out, make it all autism, and then make a new category called social communication disorder and say that's not autism. But that doesn't make very much sense because social communication problems that is part of the uh, core criteria of, um, of autism. You know, it's not precise. It's kind of a moving target here that's just kept on changing and changing and changing. And one of the things I cover in a lot of detail in the Autistic Brain book is sensory problems. And you can have sensory problems with dyslexia, ADHD, many, many different labels. And sensory problems vary from a nuisance to being so debilitating, you can't tolerate a noisy restaurant or a noisy train station or any kind of place like that. When I was a little kid and the school bell went off, it hurt my ears. Now, one of the ways you can help desensitize that is let the child initiate that sound. Then there's other kids that can't stand fluorescent lights. They can see them flicker like a strobe light. Sometimes colored glasses help. Sometimes using pale colored pastel paper will help. And one of my big things is I absolutely cannot stand scratchy clothes against my skin. There's no way you're getting wool against my skin. And the thing that I've found is that some cotton itches and other cotton does not. You know, the sensory problems is an area where we need to be doing research. We need to be doing it the sensory issues. You know, we've got a lot of papers that show, yes, there's defects in the circuits in the brain where, uh, on, on uh, you know, facial recognition and things like that. Yeah, we know all about that, but we're not doing enough studies on how to deal with sensory problems. Now, in one of the chapters of the book, we've got a, a and Richard Panic, my co-author, has done a great job of uh, getting a lot of material together. I got to thank Richard for like going through the whole all the DSMs and getting that done. And uh, one of my favorite chapters is where I talk about the different kinds of minds and also talk about the brain scans. And of course, I wanted to go out and try all the latest brain scan technology. And what basically showed up in the brain scans also showed up in the classroom, showed up in activities I did. When it came to athletics, I was good and strong. I could run really fast. But when it came to skiing, I could never keep them together and do those perfect Christies. 
and I found out my cerebellum was 20% smaller than normal. I found out that my fear center, the amygdala, the brain's fear center, was larger than normal. And that would explain why I had uh, so much anxiety problems. I got into puberty, I had terrible, terrible, terrible anxiety problems. It was horrible. That's now controlled with antidepressant medication. There are a lot of people that are super anxious where a little bit of antidepressant can really help. But one of the scans that really turned me on was a scan back, done back in 2006, and the scientists at the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon found that I had a great big, huge visual track. And that would explain my visual thinking. And then they found out that my math department was trashed because I basically I've got cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid in my left parietal cortex, so that like trashed out uh, multitasking. And one of the things I can't do is I can't remember long sequences of information. When I had a job at a dairy when I was in graduate school, you know, there was about 10 steps for setting up the dairy equipment for milk and the cows. And it, fortunately, they had it written down on a list. If I hadn't had that list, I would have been in a lot of trouble. I would have had to make my own little list. You know, so getting to see all those brain scans was really, really interesting. And in the future, we'll be able to do very precise diagnosis with brain scans. Because the greatest imaging now was invented by Walter Snyder at the University of Pittsburgh. We need to thank the de Defense Department for the funding, because it was originally developed for head injuries. And it maps white matter fiber tracks. And they looked at my circuit in my brain for speak what I see. And my circuit has greatly reduced bandwidth. So that explains why I had trouble getting speech out. And my speak what I hear circuit was really, really tiny. Now, in the future, they'd be able to use this kind of scanning to figure out exactly where the problem is. You know, this is where you know, the sensory issues are very variable. You can get different types of language problems. Some kids are echolalic. They speak just fine, yakking out all these TV commercials, but they have absolutely no idea what the TV commercials mean because the meaning circuit is probably not hooked up. Now, one of my favorite chapters is where I talk about the different kinds of minds. Because when I first wrote Thinking in Pictures, I thought everybody was a photorealistic visual thinker like me. I thought everybody on the autism spectrum thought that way. And then I started reading some reviews on Amazon, and they kind of told me that um, not everybody on the spectrum thinks that way. So then I started interviewing people about how they think. See, everything I think about is like a photorealistic picture. OK, if I think about the United Airlines terminal in Chicago, I see its glass structure. And then I'm seeing the Crystal Palace. And now I'm seeing the biosphere in Arizona. I'm seeing our greenhouse at Colorado State. I'm kind of in a glass structure category. But they're all specific glass structures. Or I could get in the airport category. And I start seeing scenes of different airports. My one for LaGuardia are these old, dingy old hangar offices they have. When I drive by there on a, in a taxi, and I go, it looks like there's interesting stuff in there. It'd be really interesting like, to, to explore in those old hangars. They probably have all kinds of really interesting, weird stuff in there. So that's one of the Im images that I have for LaGuardia Airport. Now, of course, Denver, it's the tents. That's my image for the Denver airport. Now, the more I got to thinking about thinking, I realized different kinds of minds need to work together. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. Everything is in, in pictures. Couldn't do algebra. There's a lot of kids that can't do algebra, but they can do geometry. And we need to go on to let them do geometry. Then another kind of kid on the high end of the spectrum is little math geniuses. This is the pattern thinking mind. They don't think in pictures, they think in patterns. Because in your brain, you've got two kinds of visual circuits. You've got circuits for what is something, and then you've got circuits for where is something. And the mathematical mind is the where is something. These kids often have trouble with reading. So you start seeing in third grade that the kid's good in math, well then let him take, get a harder math book. Don't make him do baby math. And then another kind of mind is the word thinker. This is the guy that knows all the facts about his favorite movie stars or baseball players. 